Um, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I have uh, the honor this morning of introducing Dr. Lindsay um, uh, Bischoff, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Her clinical responsibilities include medical directorship of Vanderbilt's thyroid center, and she's also the program director for the Endocrine Fellowship Program. In addition, um, uh, Dr. Bischoff is extremely um, involved on a national level in the ATA, the NCCN, and the International Thyroid Oncology Group. She's a member of the ATA's Differentiated Thyroid Cancer Guidelines Committee, in addition to serving on multiple other uh, committees. Um, in addition, this morning, we are joined by Dr. Elise Brett, who has been a colleague at Mount Sinai for many years, where she completed her medical school residency and fellowship training in endocrinology and metabolism. She is an associate clinical professor at the Icon School of Medicine. In addition to her private practice, she has been actively involved in fellowship training um, and has played a leadership role at the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Um, we have really a, a fascinating uh, lecture this morning. Um, uh, we encourage all of you to send in your comments, questions, um, which we will try to get to uh, before the end of the hour. Um, so, uh, Lindsay, uh, let me have you go ahead. I hope uh, no more technical uh, glitches here, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to uh, speak at this uh, forum uh, this morning. Um, technical glitches. There we go. Um, so as uh, introduced, I'm going to be talking about uh, TSH goals after a thyroid lobectomy in low-risk thyroid cancer and in active surveillance. This is my institution. Uh, here is Vanderbilt Medical Center. We are located on the same uh, campus as the rest of Vanderbilt, so the undergraduate and the um, graduate uh, universities. And um, it's right on the edge of uh, downtown Nashville, which is a growing place. A um, lot of uh, cool new things to do. I've been down here about seven years. Um, and other than uh, the humidity, it's, it's a pretty good place. So um, please come down and visit us. I have no financial disclosures. So the organization of my talk will be first to define low-risk thyroid cancer as we currently uh, see it. We'll define active surveillance. We'll discuss some data on reasons people may choose uh, thyroid lobectomy, total thyroidectomy, or active surveillance. And we'll review the 2015 American Thyroid Association recommended TSH goals for low-risk disease. We'll then look at more recent data on the impact of TSH on thyroid cancer recurrence after lobectomy, as well as the impact of TSH on thyroid cancer progression in active surveillance. And I thought we would frame this discussion in a case. So this is something that um, many of us uh, have seen or see on a regular basis. This is a 36-year-old female who is incidentally found to have a thyroid nodule after imaging for a migraine. Her ultrasound shows a solitary right-sided 2.8 centimeter isoechoic nodule that is mostly solid, wider than tall, has smooth borders and no calcifications. And so by the ACR TIRAD system, we would categorize this as a TIRADS4 nodule. There are no suspicious features um, in the lymph nodes in either the central or lateral neck. So the nodule met biopsy criteria, was biopsied and found to be papillary thyroid carcinoma. Her only medical history is occasional migraine headaches and she takes no medicine. She feels well, has no family history of thyroid disease and her baseline TSH is 1.8. She's sent to see an endocrinologist and a surgeon and her management uh, options are discussed. Given the size of the tumor, surgery is recommended and the patient agrees on that. Discuss, discussion of the type of surgery then ensues. 
uh, and risks and benefits of, of a total thyroidectomy as compared to a thyroid lobectomy are discussed, incurred, including nerve injury or voice problems, hypocalcemia, the possibility of a need for a second surgery, and the possibility of the need for lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. In shared decision-making with her team, the patient ultimately opts for a partial thyroidectomy, a thyroid lobectomy. Um, and the reasons for this is due to presumed low-risk disease. We want, she wanted to minimize surgical risk, and she wanted to try to avoid thyroid hormone replacement. So we're currently defining low-risk thyroid cancer by the 2015 um, American Thyroid Association uh, kind of rubric, um, which includes intrathyroidal, follicular, and papillary thyroid carcinoma minimally invasive follicular thyroid carcinoma, tumors that are four centimeters or less in size. And we've extended that to include metastases of lymph nodes. So five or fewer lymph nodes that have metastases at two millimeters or less. And this translates to about a one to 5% recurrence. And using the AJCC eighth edition of the TNN staging, these patients would be considered stage one, and that translates to a 98 to 100% disease-specific survival when looking at the SEER database. So overall, this group of patients does very well. The management of low-risk thyroid cancer has really changed over time, and we've really backed off on the degree of intervention. Prior to 2009, the majority of these tumors were treated with total thyroidectomy and many had radioiodine therapy after that. Since then, lobectomy has been increasingly more common and recommended um, and radioiodine is now typically avoided in low risk uh, tumors. And the reason for this is it's found that overall total thyroidectomy compared to lobectomy does not impact survival or recurrence and the lower surgical complication risk um, is a benefit of the, the thyroid lobectomy because we're not giving radioiodine as frequently to this low risk group, a total thyroidectomy is not needed to facilitate the radioiodine therapy. And many patients will choose a thyroid lobectomy to avoid lifelong thyroid hormone. The difficulty is knowing what our long-term management of patients after a thyroid lobectomy should be. Most of our data is on patients that had a total thyroidectomy and radioiodine. And so this, um, this causes uh, some concern on how to guide surveillance. In addition, what is our TSH goal for these patients? Do they need to go on thyroid hormone replacement? Do they need TSH suppression? So we're gonna focus on um, thyroid hormone replacement since we'll be talking about TSH goals. Active surveillance um, has also become uh, more common and is uh, still a relatively, I think, new field um, or new practice for many endocrinologists and surgeons. Um, as many of you know that the data out of uh, Kuma Hospital over the years has shown that active surveillance, which is close monitoring of diagnosed thyroid cancer uh, without performing surgery or other interventions, um, has uh, met with, with significant success in avoiding surgery. Um, often this is considered a, sort of a surgical delay. Um, and so the, the uh, surveillance would continue until there are changes to the tumor, changes to the patient's preference, or other circumstances that might result in intervention. Patients that um, would fit into the category of being appropriate for active surveillance typically have very low risk tumors. Um, and so a more accepted um, patient population for this would be patients with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma without extrathyroidal extension, without nodal disease or distant metastases. In addition, active surveillance can be used for patients where surgery may be higher risk than the disease itself um, due to the patient being a high risk surgical candidate, have short life expectancy, or have concurrent medical or surgical issues um, that need to be addressed prior to surgery. 
But again, we're gonna be focusing on patients with low risk tumors. Some potential benefits of active surveillance are to avoid and or delay surgery and avoid thyroid hormone replacement. Some potential drawbacks include patient anxiety or disease progression. But again, is there a TSH goal? Should these patients have TSH suppression and does that decrease the risk of tumor progression? There have been some studies looking at why patients favor total thyroidectomy, lobectomy, or active surveillance. Um, looking, at patient looking at factors that influence uh, total thyroidectomy versus lobectomy, um, Amadi's group in 2020 published in thyroid and Dr. Lubitz's group in 2021 published in endocrine practice. And they found that concerns for risk of recurrent thyroid cancer influence patients to total thyroidectomy, um, risk of surgical complication, voice, nerve, or hypercalcemia issues uh, influence patients to lobectomy. And another major uh, influence toward lobectomy was the concern for needing lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. There is some data looking at active surveillance versus surgery. So Dr. Saka um, in both 2020 and 2022 uh, published in thyroid, the Canadian active, Canadian active surveillance uh, study um, that showed that 70% of patients favored active surveillance to surgery. And this was, um, in no small part due to fear of taking love with aroxin, um, which was an independent factor for favoring active surveillance. So I thought we would just review the role of TSH suppression in thyroid cancer. I think many of us are very familiar with um, this concept. So as we know, the TSH binds to the TSH receptor and causes downstream imp impacts through the cyclic AMP uh, pathway that leads to increasing thyroglobulin production and upregulation of sodium, the sodium iodine symporter, um, which results in cell growth and proliferation. And thereby suppression of TSH with thyroid hormone has been used uh, with the goal of decreasing the cell growth and reducing the risk of recurrent thyroid cancer. But how does TSH suppression translate clinically? So again, going back to the 2015 American Thyroid Association Thyroid Cancer Guidelines, there are different TSH goals depending on the pathology. High-risk patients are recommended to have a suppressed TSH to less than 0.1. Intermediate risk patients have a recommended TSH of 0.1 to 0.5. And low-risk patients have a TSH goal of 0.5 to 2 and that's following total or uh, partial thyroidectomy. Um, so it doesn't differentiate between the two. Um, and that is, uh, that is considered um, lo low quality of evidence as uh, um, defined in the, in the guidelines. So looking at this group, does this really decrease recurrence risk? Um, and so that's, that's really the question for us. What is a typical TSH after a thyroid lobectomy? So we do have data on um, the, the TSH ranges that we see after a thyroid lobectomy. And we found that about 70% of patients maintain a TSH within the normal reference range after a thyroid lobectomy. So in 2008, De Carlucci's group looked at 168 youth thyroid patients who underwent lobectomy for benign disease they defined hypothyroidism as a TSH of greater than five and a half. And they found that 32.8% of patients became hypothyroid by that def definition within a median follow-up time of 29 months. Lee's group in 2020 uh, published in Endocrine did a systemic re systematic review and meta-analysis of 51 studies that looked at hypothyroidism after lobectomy. And they found that the pooled risk of hypothyroidism was about 29.9% after thyroid lobectomy. But what if we use the 2015 ATA targets? So Cox and colleagues in 2017 published in Surgery, a retrospective review of 478 patients who were not previously on thyroid hormone who underwent a thyroid lobectomy 
73% of these patients had benign disease and 27% had malignant. Overall, 350 patients, so 73% of the total, had a TSH of greater than two within one year after surgery. And of the 148 patients with thyroid cancer, 78% had a TSH of greater than two um, at one year post-op. Shum and colleagues in 2021 published an endocrine practice, did a retrospective review of 104, sorry, 115 patients with low risk papillary thyroid cancer who had lobectomy at a single institution. And they also looked at TSH level and whether or not levothyroxine was initiated. They followed these patients over 2.6 years and found that 84% had a TSH greater than two. They found that a higher pre-op TSH of 1.7, so not all that high, um, as compared to 0.85, increased their risk of having a TSH of greater than two post partial thyroidectomy. Um, and that was statistically significant. Out of the patients with a TSH of greater than two, 68% were started on levothyroxine. So in practice, we're telling people that they will unlikely need levothyroxine after lobectomy, and we say you know, 70% to 80% chance that you will not. But we're putting most people on levothyroxine within a year if they have a partial thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer. Do we need to? So does, low, does a low normal TSH reduce the risk of recurrence in low risk thyroid cancer after a partial thyroidectomy? And of course, the data are conflicting. There are three recent studies that we'll review that um, look at this question specifically. Park and colleagues in 2018 in the Journal of Surgical Oncology looked at 1,047 patients after thyroid lobectomy and central neck dissection for thyroid cancer. All of these patients had only classic type PTC and they were categorized as low or intermediate risk for recurrence based on the 2015 um, ATA guidelines. They had follow-up at one, six, and 12 months with ultrasound and TSH, and the reference range for TSH was 0.4 to 5.0. The definition of recurrence was structural, so either cytologically or histologically proven disease or cross-sectional imaging um, evidence of disease that was not previously present. 55% of these patients had low risk and 45% had intermediate risk for recurrent disease. And ultimately they had a 4% uh, recurrence rate. They found that both tumor size and TSH at one year predicted recurrence. The tumor size was actually quite small, greater than 0.85 centimeters. Um, and a TSH of greater than 1.85 at one year uh, predicted um, uh, recurrence. So factors that did not predict recurrence, they found were the ATA risk stratification, um, which in other, other studies has actually been shown to be quite good at predicting recurrence. And this could be due to the large number of intermediate risk patients and uh, the heterogeneity in, in that group. So their conclusion was that TSH does impact thyroid cancer recurrence in low-risk patients. And they recommend a TSH goal of less than 1.85 to reduce this risk for recurrence. This was a particularly short-term uh, uh, study at one year, just to make note. Lee and colleagues in 2019 um, looked at 1,528 consecutive patients after thyroid lobectomy for thyroid cancer. They used multiple uh, variants of PTC, but it excluded aggressive variants. Um, all patients were categorized as low risk by the 2015 ATA uh, stratification. And follow-up was yearly for 5.6 years with both ultrasound and TSH. Some patients were on levothyroxine while others were not, and the TSH reference range that was used was 0.5 to 4.5. They categorized these people, these patients into four subgroups um, based on their TSH. So there was a suppressed TSH of less than 0.5, a low normal group of uh, 0.5 to 1.9, a high normal TSH group of two to 
and an elevated TSH group of greater than 4.5. And they looked at both a dominant and mean TSH. The dominant TSH was defined as the TSH group with the highest frequency during follow-up for each patient. Um, and then they analyzed the data for a total overall follow-up and at five year, at the five-year time point. Uh, the definition of recurrence was also structural, either histologically or cytologically proven disease. Looking at the baseline TSHs for these patients, you see that um, about half had a TSH greater than two, so already outside of the, um, the low risk for recurrence recommendations for, by the ATA. The patients that really met the criteria, which would be 0.5 to 2, um, would, was really only about a third of, of the patients. This forest plot I thought was just a really good visual um, instead of going through all the numbers. Um, this is looking at recurrence-free survival uh, based on um, mean and dominant uh, TSH levels uh, at five years and um, for the total over, overall assessment. And they looked at both univariate and multivariate analyses. And you can see here that each analyses, um, A, B, C, and D, um, had data that was not statistically significant. So every confidence interval crossed one. Um, and so they found that there was no difference um, in uh, in recurrence rate. So overall, they had 1.4% of patients that had structural recurrence at five years, so a, a low risk um, uh, group. And so that kind of makes sense. The TSH did not impact recurrence in any analysis. They also did um, a sub-analysis looking at levothyroxine use and its impact on recurrence and found that there was no impact um, on recurrence on, based on whether or not a patient was on levothyroxine. So they concluded that uh, TSH does not impact recurrence in low-risk patients. And finally, a recent study by Zhu and colleagues just recently published in thyroid looked at 2,297 consecutive patients after thyroid lobectomy for thyroid cancer who were started on levothyroxine therapy. Um, they again excluded aggressive variants of PTC, but otherwise, um, included other variants. Patients had ATA uh, categorized low, intermediate, and high-risk tumors in this study. And follow-up was every six months for five years, and then year, uh, one year after that, with a mean follow-up of 70 months. <clears throat> the reference range was 0.5 to 4 for the TSH, and also they categorized them into subgroups. And the definition was again of recurrence was again structural, um, was cytologically or histologically proven disease or cross sectional imaging um, that was not previously present. So 41% of these patients had low risk disease, um, but quite a few had intermediate and high risk. So 42% had intermediate and 16.4% had high risk. And so that would be an unusual group um, for thyroid lobectomies. Um, if you look at the uh, TSH spread, um, they also looked at quartiles. Suppressed was less than 0.5, low normal was 0.5 to less than two, high normal was two to less than four, and um, a TSH of greater than four was considered elevated. And they found that 29% had a suppressed TSH 50% had a TSH that would have met the, the low risk for recurrence uh, TSH goal based on the ATA. So that was 50.6%. Um, and then about 18.3% had a TSH that was, uh, that was higher than two. And so if we look here at figure A, we can see the mean TSH in the overall study cohort. Um, TSH is on the X axis. And so we can see here that the majority of these patients had a TSH that was less than two. Figure B shows the stratification of uh, the risk stratification based on TSH. Um, and percentage wise, there was no difference in terms of uh, TSH uh, quartile 
um, per recurrence risk category. So they had a high recurrence rate, 7.3%, with 81.4% uh, being in the intermediate or high risk. So again, not the typical thyroid lobectomy uh, group. Um, in the low risk category, looking looking at recurrence-free survival, um, comparing any of the quartiles, you know, suppressed versus low normal, um, low normal to high normal, any way you look at it, the TS, the TSH, um, I'm sorry, the, the recurrence risk was no different. And so here are the p-values um, on, the, on the right of this column. And you can see that there's no statistical significance when comparing uh, recurrence-free survival um, within any of those uh, TSH comparisons. In the intermediate to high risk, there was one that was statistically significant, and that was a TSH that was low normal in comparison to a TSH that was elevated. Um, oddly, comparing a suppressed TSH to an elevated TSH did not quite meet statistical significance, um, although seemed to approach it. So uh, for our purposes, again, we're looking at low risk thyroid cancer. And so the conclusion of uh, Zhu and colleagues was that the TSH level did not impact recurrence and low risk thyroid cancer. So we've got conflicting data. Um, these studies were all retrospective. Um, so let's do a little bit more digging. Um, there is one uh, randomized control trial that looks at TSH on P in PTC recurrence. This is from 2010. Um, but it was after a total thyroidectomy. So let's look at this study. This was uh, by Sugatani and colleagues um, and published in JCEM in 2010. And they looked at 433 patients that were randomized to either TSH suppression or no TSH suppression. They did not specifically look at lobectomy, however, uh, they did state that the majority of their patients, so 367 out of the 433, had a less than total thyroidectomy. However, that was not um, more clearly defined. 66 had a total or near total thyroidectomy. The majority of patients had low risk disease. However, microcarcinoma was excluded. So 383 patients had low risk disease. Group A was the TSH suppression group. Group B was the no TSH suppression group. They had a similar N. Um, looking at sort of baseline characteristics, they both had uh, the majority less than total thyroidectomy, 183 in group A and 184 in group B. Um, so of course that was not uh, significantly different. Um, same about low risk categories, so 194 in group A and 189 in group B, again, no difference. What was clearly different was the TSH. Um, and so in the TSH suppression group, they had a TSH on average of 0 0.07 and the no TSH suppression group had a TSH on average of 3.19. That was clearly a significant, um, significant difference. But when they looked at the overall recurrence, there was no difference with 10% in the suppression group and 13% in the no suppression group with a p-value of 0.42. And then when they looked at five-year disease-free survival, it was also the same in both groups, 91% for the TSH suppression group and 89% in the no TSH suppression group. And again, that p-value was not significant at 0.39. So their conclusion, was that TSH did not impact recurrence. So going back to our case, our patient comes back for her six week post-op visit. Um, she had undergone a partial thyroidectomy, a thyroid lobectomy with um, a final pathology showing a 1.3 centimeter classic type papillary thyroid cancer. There was no extrathyroidal extension, no lymphatic invasion, no vascular invasion, negative margins. One little lymph node got plucked out because it was stuck to the lobe um, and there was no cancer in that lymph node. Her six-week post-op TSH was 
she feels well. So that that's six six weeks. So what did I do? I did not start her on thyroid hormone. Um, she comes back again uh, six months later. Um, she still feels well. She has no concerns with energy, weight, or mental acuity. Her menses are normal. They're monthly. She has not had any voice changes. She's not had any hoarseness. She's happy with her minimal and fading surgical scar. And her TSH is 2.5. She has a neck ultrasound that shows a surgically absent right thyroid lobe, a normal left thyroid lobe with homogeneous architecture and no abnormal lymph nodes. Does she need thyroid hormone? And so I think as presented, the data is, is conflicting and it's not entirely clear, um, but I, I will tell you, I would not put her on thyroid hormone. Uh, and uh, she's happy with that decision. What about the TSH impact on active surveillance? Very limited. So we'll look at another case to frame this discussion. This is a 48 year old female um, who again has an inc incidental finding of a thyroid nodule. We deal with these all the time. Um, and the radiology report for the ultrasound uh, describes a left-sided solitary nine millimeter nodule that was solid hypoechoic with irregular borders and punctate calcifications. And on the ultrasound report, it says Tyrads 5 highly suspicious. So those words were concerning to the primary care doctor and the patient was sent for a biopsy, which came back as papillary thyroid carcinoma. So she sent to an endocrinologist and a surgeon uh, for consultation. At that consultation, she is counseled on the risks and benefits of total thyroidectomy, um, lobectomy, and active surveillance. She's worried about weight gain and fatigue from hypothyroidism and favors ultrasound surveillance. She has a full neck ultrasound with lymph node mapping showing that the nodule is in the mid left thyroid lobe and does not abut the capsule and all lymph nodes appear normal morphology. She has a TSH of 3.2. So active surveillance and low risk for recurrent thyroid cancer after a lobectomy are both dealing with low risk tumors, but they are different situations because in active surveillance, the disease is still present. Um, there's two um, studies that look at the association of TSH um, with uh, active surveillance um, and tumor progression. We'll look through those. So Sugatani in 2014 uh, published in the World Journal of Surgery, 322 patients with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma undergoing active surveillance. Um, they evaluated TSH level and uh, change in tumor size. So TSH level was, was checked at baseline, and then there was a mean TSH uh, average during follow-up. They used a normal reference range of 0.5 to 4, and they had a mean follow-up of six and a half years, ranging between two and 20 years. Ultimately, they found that 6% of tumors uh, increased in size. 91% had no change in size and 3% uh, decreased in size. And so this table is looking at baseline TSH and tumor size. And if you look here again, we have it broken up into quartiles, a suppressed TSH, a TSH that's low normal, a TSH that's high normal, and then a TSH that's elevated and greater than four. Looking at patients who had a size increase, no one that had a suppressed TSH and no one that had a TSH of greater than four had a size increase. Um, but about half of the patients that had size increases had a low normal TSH or a high normal TSH. In patients that had no change, it was sort of continuous across the board, um, not any difference. And then in patients that had a decrease by three millimeters, again, None of the patients with a suppressed TSH had a decrease. None of the patients with an elevated TSH had a decrease. And it was pretty split in terms of who had a decrease in size between a low normal TSH and a high normal TSH. And so when this was analyzed for uh, statistical significance, it was found that there was no difference in tumor change based on TSH quartile. 
And that is, um, had a TSH, uh, I'm sorry, a, a P value of 0.47. So this is looking um, at it in a little bit of a different way. Um, same study. Uh, on the left here, we have a Kaplan-Meier curve that shows the dotted line is a baseline TSH of less than two. Um, the solid line is a baseline TSH of greater than two. Um, and this is um, looking at progression-free survival. And you can see that it is the same. And again, p-value is 0.67. And here's a scatter plot looking again at baseline TSH and tumor change in volume. And um, there's no association between baseline TSH and tumor change. Again, p value is 0.85. And then this is the same idea, but instead of looking at a baseline TSH, we're looking at a mean TSH. And again, no association with a p value of 0.7. So Sugatani's group concluded that TSH does not impact tumor growth. Another study that came out in 2018 in JCEM by Kim and colleagues looked at a cohort of 127 papillary microcarcinomas in 126 patients. They also did serial TSH and ultrasound every six to 12 months with a median follow-up of 25 months um, that ranged from 17 to 37 months. The TSH was categorized into tertiles with a primary outcome of disease progression of greater than 50% volume from baseline. They also looked at secondary outcomes of uh, disease progression of greater than three millimeters and development of lymph node metastases. Um, they defined their TSH tertile categories as low, which was 0 0.16 to 1.58, middle 1.58 to 2.38, and high, which was 2.38, all the way up to 9.16. And they found that in the low TSH tertile, 11.9% of patients had disease progression. In the middle, 14% had disease progression and in the high 33.3% had disease progression. And they did find that this difference was statistically significant. So when they compared the groups, looking at the, little, the low to middle um, uh, uh, tertiles rather, um, there was no significant uh, difference with a p-value of 0.489. But when they compared the low risk group, I'm sorry, the low TSH group to the high TSH group, that was significant with a p-value of 0 0.02. When they did a log rank assessment, looking at where the cutoff for disease progression um, seemed to have the inflection point, um, that was at 2.5. Um, and that was with a statistically significant p-value of less than 0 0.001. So Kim and colleagues concluded that the TS, a TSH of greater than 2.5 contributed to disease progression in active surveillance. A TSH level of less than 2.5 did not contribute to disease progression. And further TSH suppression um, was not useful. So does TSH impact progression in active surveillance? I think um, the jury is, is really still out. I don't, I don't think our data really is, is telling us what to do yet. Um, so going back to our case, does she need thyroid hormone? She returns, again, I did not start her on thyroid hormone. She returns a year later, her ultrasound is unchanged. TSH is 2.8. Um, so in summary, avoiding levothyroxine is a major goal for patients who opt for thyroid lobectomy or active surveillance. Um, and that's due to the medicalization um, of being on a lifelong pill, the routine lab assessment, um, and the psychological and financial impacts uh, that it carries. Targeting um, the ATA TSH range for low risk thyroid cancer, however, results in significantly higher use of levothyroxine after thyroid lobectomy. Um, but the data are conflicting if this is really helpful or not. Again, there is one randomized controlled trial that indicates that maybe it is, it is not helpful. Um, Overall, the data are conflicting regarding TSH goals and active surveillance. And I don't think we have a lot in terms of um, 
how to recommend uh, navigating that based on our current data. Um, so we do need more, pros more prospective studies evaluating the impact of TSH on both active surveillance uh, disease progression and recurrence after lobectomy. Um, when we're making these decisions with our patients, we do need to consider the impact of lifelong thyroid hormone against the risks of avoiding it. Um, and it may be reasonable to allow for a higher normal TSH in low risk patients after lobectomy to avoid levothyroxine. So as we learn more, some things change and some things stay the same. And it's my shameless family kid picture that I Thank you very much. Terrific. Um, Lindsay, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, just a terrific review. And um, uh, you framed uh, the arguments incredibly well here. Um, uh, let me let me just ask uh, one question from the audience uh, just to start off. Um, one of the uh, um, listeners asked about drawing conclusions regarding the risk of structural recurrence uh, for uh, follow up less than five years, and perhaps you can comment on that. Yeah, I I agree. Um, we have data that about seventy seven percent of recurrence happens in the first. 4.8 years um, after surgery. And then the majority of the remaining happens within the first eight years. And then there's a percentage or two that might happen later. Um, but, you know, I, I absolutely agree. You know, any really good study needs to look um, at least to five years um, to be able to really say what the impact on recurrence is. Great. Um, Elise, uh, maybe you can comment on, uh, for starters, on these two cases and tell us what your practice is, uh, how you would manage them with respect to um, uh, TSH goals. My practice to the current time has been to follow the ATA guidelines and I have been using, I have been using thyroid hormone um, to keep the TSH less than two, but I, I definitely, Definitely have been a little uncomfortable in the low risk patients making that recommendation. Um, uh, as far as the second case, um, that patient I would have sent to surgery. Um, I would not have been comfortable following that patient. Um, and I have not, um, I, I do have some patients um, undergoing active surveillance uh, sort of against my recommendations, but I have not placed those patients on thyroid hormone. Great. Lindsay, can you comment on quality of life in patients who are receiving thyroid hormone as a supplement as opposed to uh, when they've got a remaining lobe as opposed to a uh, replacement therapy? Is there a difference? Do we know? That, that's a great question. I, I think the answer is probably we don't really know. There are some quality of life studies um, looking at uh, TSH levels and whether or not someone's on thyroid hormone. Um, and, and those are also sort of conflicting and variable. Um, you know, I think it's really, I think it's really tough. Um, anecdotally, I, I feel like patients are all over, all over the place. And, uh, you know, if someone has a T, you know, I, it's, it's, um, it's hard to make these hard and fast recommendations because I think we all do things that are specific to each situation. And, and that's why we're, you know, that's why we do what we do. But, you know, for example, if it's a 25 year old female and her TSH is 2.8 um, after lobectomy and it used to be 1.2 and she's feeling tired and she's, you know, maybe got a family history of thyroid hormone, I mean, thyroid dysfunction and she wants to start thyroid hormone, I would be fine starting on thyroid hormone, it, you know. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I'll have a patient that walks in my office that's non-compliant after a total with a TSH of 200 and feels fine. And then there's a patient that, you know, swears her TSH is off and it's greater than two and she's feeling awful. And I check it and she's right. And, you know, she feels better with this low normal TSH. So I, I really don't know the answer. I do think um, probably, at least anecdotally, there's some benefit 
to taking a supplemental uh, thyroid hormone replacement opposed to a full, um, you know, uh, replacement weight based replacement dose. But but I don't have a lot of data to, to support that. Okay, um, Elise, uh, how how often do patient symptoms? Um, I, guide your decision-making when TSH is within range um, and not necessarily uh, um, suppress less than two? Um, very, very often. Okay. Um, so as long as, as long as I'm not doing any harm, um, I often uh, will, will titrate to patient symptoms. And, and how, does, um, how does age impact your decision-making um, in terms of uh, these two cases, um, does it, does it, does age play a role here? Um, either Lindsay or Elise. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't suppress these patients if they're young or, you know, obviously if they're older, we worry, you know, about atrial fibrillation. And I think some of those studies are looking at, um, um, endogenous thyroid hormone where maybe T3 has, has a little bit more of a role, but, um, you know, endogenous hyper hyperthyroidism, but in a young patient, you know, I don't want to suppress that patient either due to future osteoporosis. So, you know, a, a TSH of one or two and a half based on someone's age doesn't, doesn't influence me, I would say much at all. Unless, unless they're, um, really like over, unless they're really 80 or above, um, as long as their TSH is not suppressed, um, I don't get worried about treating with thyroid hormone. Great. Um, so Steve Sherman has uh, raised the following question. Um, uh, Lindsay, how well did the studies account for other confounding factors that might impact TSH level <laughs> or stimulation through um, the TSH receptor, and he uses as an example of auto, autoimmune thyroiditis, increasing yeah. the risk for hypothyroidism over time, um, could, uh, or pregnancy, great. or TSH receptor antibodies. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, you know, none of the patients were pregnant. Those, those were excluded, um, but, but there was variability. Um, they, they didn't have sort of a one study did have a TPO um, assessment as uh, positive TPO was a was an exclusion criteria, um, but that was not true for all studies. Um, they did make sure the patients were euthyroid prior, so if they if they had you know previously elevated TSH or previously previous need for thyroid hormone, um, they were excluded. Um, so I would say there's some variability. It was it was you know, evaluated to a degree, um, but, but probably imperfect. Great. Um, another one of our listeners, Dr. Gonzalez Velasquez, uh, asked the following, tumor uh, progression is a consequence of multiple factors. When specifically speaking about TSH suppression, time and treatment adherence is a big factor to take into account. Is there a way um, that studies evaluating tumor progression take into account if patients maintain TSH suppression over time rather than just using baseline TSH levels? Um, it, it, it seemed to me that that was the reason that um, studies didn't always just use mean TSH. Um, so there was this, you know, it, the TSH had the most the highest frequency, um, which would they call the dominant TSH, I think was an attempt to correct for that, um, that fluctuation, absorption issues, compliance issue, issues. Um, but I think that's definitely a confounder um, that, that is gonna impact, you know, TSH doesn't always stay 0.5, um, but, but I, that's, that's really what they were trying to do when they looked at the dominant TSH was what was the highest frequency of the quartile that that patient landed in? And they used that instead of the, me the mean. But when they looked at, at that, that data, it also didn't impact recurrence. Lindsay, are you surprised that in the zoo study, there were 20% of patients that were above the target range? A little, yeah, I was a little surprised. Um, I was also surprised that there was such a high proportion of 
intermediate and high risk patients. Um, so that wouldn't be a, a typical practice for us to, to do a lobectomy on someone that has high risk for a current disease. So let me ask you, um, I, I'd, I'd like you to design the ideal study um, uh, and tell me how, uh, um, how would you would put that together? Um, do you have any uh, sense on how many patients uh, would be needed to, and how long you would follow them in order to answer this question? I don't know how many people would be needed. That that is probably not my my strength in, in answering. But in terms of duration, um, I, I would favor ten years. You know, at least eight um, to to capture the majority of recurrence. Um, it you know it should be a prospective study. You know, all of this is sort of observational data. Um, and so, you know, the best we have is this sort of randomized control trial. And I think that was good, but we need to do that specifically for thyroid lobectomies and we need to extend it to, I would say a minimum of eight years. But the end, I, I don't know, I, I, there's someone on here listening that would say, what? Cause I don't know what the end would need to be, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, do you have any idea whether that actually people are enrolling for that study at the moment? Not, not, not to my knowledge. I think, you know, funding is a big, a big issue with studies like this. Um, not, not a lot of funding available, but not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, is there any, is there any impact on the data on the fact that the patients in the park study all underwent routine prophylactic central compartment neck dissection? Little unusual, right? To do, uh, to do lobectomy and central neck dissection. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, th I think we have other data that shows that prophylactic central neck dissection doesn't reduce recurrence. Um, so I, I don't know that that would make a, make a big impact. Perhaps um, it was part of decision-making as to whether or not there was a role for doing a completion at the same time. Um, that's my guess here in, in looking at that study. Um, uh, and, and Elise, it sounds like there's a reluctance on your part to recommend active surveillance. Is that true across the board? Um, how, where do you stand on that? It is true across the board. <laughs> okay. Um, it, your feeling is the data is just not compelling? Or um in my in my setting in a in a private practice, um, I'm not comfortable with it. Okay, Lindsay, how about uh, down in Nashville? Is there acceptance of active surveillance? Um, you know, I I would say there's a lot of variability. Uh, you know, it's a it's a big change for a lot of people, and I think both from a physician standpoint and a patient standpoint, there's a lot of variability. So, you know, I think a lot of times new things can be, um, you know, we, we used to do total thyroidectomies, prophylactic central neck dissections and give radio iodine to like almost everyone. And so, you know, you were doing that 30 years ago and now we're not even operating. I think that can sometimes be a hard pill to swallow. Um, I, you know, I do um, active surveillance in a very specific population um, and it needs to definitely be shared decision-making. Um, and we have sort of, it's protocolized and, and it's um, you know very clear in terms of follow-up and where the ultrasounds are gonna get done and that I can see the images and, and it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's pretty specific, but I do not do any active surveillance less in, in tumors that are greater than a centimeter. And I know there's some data pushing, um, pushing active surveillance to larger tumors. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I'm not quite ready for that. The, the data I don't think is quite, quite there. Um, but um, I do think that ultimately in a disease that has a near 100% survival, because we're talking about these low risk patients um, and, um, you know, has a low recurrence rate, one to 5%, that um, active surveillance is not a, an inappropriate option, but it does have to be the right tumor and the right person. Great. Um, and, and are you 
um, when you are um, uh, advising active surveillance, uniformly um, you're not suppressing them or trying to keep them at some in some part of the the range or what's your practice if if they're not on thyroid hormone and their their tsh is in a normal range i do not put them on thyroid hormone certainly if they had subclinical hypothyroidism i would um but if they're not on thyroid hormone i would not initiate it and and how often um in somebody that you start um on thyroid hormone um, in either of these categories, after lobectomy or active surveillance, how, how often are you checking them? What's the burden on them to, uh, to get follow-up labs? Uh, full, it's you know, more imaging. Whenever we do imaging, I tend to do labs. So it's initially six months and then, and then yearly. Okay, great. Um, I, uh, Elise, do you have any other questions, comments? Uh, no. All right. Great. All right. Well, listen, thank you uh, very much to both of you, Lindsay. That was an awesome uh, presentation. Um, really, really very thoughtful uh, review of the literature. And um, thank you very much. I apologize for the uh, um, some of the uh, challenges at the front end of this, but um, this was just great. So thank you both. I hope uh, um, everyone will join us again uh, next week and um, uh, everybody stay safe. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks Have so much for having day. me. My pleasure. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.